David, we're uh, very grateful you could be with us this morning to help tell the story of Pflugerville. It's the 50th uh, year that it's been a city. Uh, tell us your name and where you were born. David Beasling, and I was born in a little place called Rungi, Texas. And uh, what was your role in the city of Pflugerville? Uh, I became the, the first police chief at the time in one man police department. Uh, I was working at the city of Austin and I lived out here and they were going to start a police department and I said, I'll give that a try. I, so I applied for it and, and they hired me and I came out and it's been a fun trip all the way. It's, it's been wonderful people to deal with. Um, in Austin it was great. And, but out here it was not just dealing with numbers. I got to know these people and it was a lot of fun being able to work with people you cared about and knew. It was kind of the Andy Griffin style. So I, I really enjoyed working with people. What was your very first impression of this community when you moved here or, or when you first saw Pflugerville? It reminded me of home. Uh, I lived in Austin. I mean, I'd been a lot through Austin and worked there. But this reminded me of home, of Rungi and Nordheim and those little areas in, in South Texas. So, uh, 1965 is when it was incorporated. Think about, in your life, what were you doing in 1965? Uh, I was still in high school. <laughs> I was and where were you in high school? At, at the time, I was in Rungi. Okay. Uh, so, then when you arrived in Pflugerville um, uh, and took the job, where were the... Uh, headquarters or where was the city government at that time? The city hall was uh, where the Chamber of Commerce is now uh, and there was a little room to the side. Uh, before that it was a Honda shop and this is where they went in there and they paid their bill or uh, ordered parts and it had a little window going to it and a door. Uh, the mayor at the time, uh, Clarence Bowles, wonderful man, cleaned out half the side of the desk and he says this is your half of the desk this is my half. And we shared the desk for several years like that. Um, tell us about what a typical city council meeting might be like back in those days. They were very interesting. It was a smoke-filled room. That was before they kind of put a stop to smoking and most of them smoked and they had the tables lined up around. It was very, very casual and uh, very easy to talk to these people. Wonderful folks. Uh, did many citizens come to the, uh, no. the council meeting? There was not that many citizens at the time. There was, uh, at the time, I guess the population was 745 when I uh, started to work for the city. Uh, what, were, uh, what were your duties when you first came on uh, board? Well, I was supposed to be the police chief or policeman, and uh, as time went on, they had kind of expanded. There was uh, three city employees, the city secretary, uh, the water, wastewater man, and myself. Uh, many times I would help at the wastewater, uh, do wastewater when he was gone, or I'd help him dig up a ditch, uh, replace water lines when they were leaked. Uh, when they were leaking, we shuffled cars and equipment back and forth uh, so they could get his truck there with his tools and his uh, backhoe there to dig the ditch. Um, I mowed the grass, I painted City Hall inside and out while I was here. Uh, and it seemed like no one really mind as long as I was working. It, it, they didn't complain about me being a policeman 40 hours a week. They wanted somebody working. And, and so it fit in very good with uh, the folks here. Uh, they just want to see a worker. <laughs> so describe, did they buy you a police car? There was a police car, and they had a police car when I got here, and they budgeted the salary. And that's all they budgeted for. Uh, so other things didn't happen so easy. I, uh, there was very little of anything to work with. Our, the first shirts and pants we bought were from the city of Austin. They sell the old uniforms. And I think we were paying 30 and 35 cents for used shirts so that I could have a uniform shirt uh, and pants. Uh, <laughs> and so every, and as officers were added over the years, we continued that trend for quite some time. We wore the same uniform Austin had. So uh, was there any law enforcement officer prior to you, or was it county? Uh, uh before me, it was uh, the sheriff's office. And actually, before that, Pflugerville had some town marshals. Uh, I don't know that much about them, but I do know they had some town marshals. Uh, they had a municipal court judge, who's still the municipal court judge today, 
Mr. Marshall? Yes, J.B. Marshall, wonderful man. He was, he was wonderful for the community. He born and raised here, and he belonged here. And uh, he was a great judge, and, and is so a great judge. court was held in the same building there? Yes. Uh, we court. would, uh, at the time, the city couldn't really afford to bring the city attorney out to do a, a traffic case. So we all crammed in that little office. The judge sat at my desk, and I put up a chair on the other side. And the person who was uh, fighting the ticket, or whatever it was, uh, sat on the other, right next to me. And we, I gave the city's testimony, and he, and no attorney was in the room at all. So it was, it was quite exciting. <laughs> uh, so what were the typical uh, citations that you gave back in the early days? Were they mostly speeding tickets, or was it anything beyond that? There was a lot of speeding tickets. Um, that was, I think, one of the biggest reasons they wanted to start a police department because there were complaints about uh, 1825, how fast the speeders were going through there and the school zones. And uh, uh, at the time, the gravel buckets or the uh, dump trucks, they felt they were racing through town a lot. And that was my understanding why they started the police department more than anything. Plus, they knew they were going to grow. Um. Tell us about Pecan Street. So uh, was there a light uh, or stop signs? There was a, a flashing yellow light and a flashing red light that, on the same uh, uh, light at, down at Railroad and Pecan. And that, I think, was put in at the fire department's request so that they get people slow down so they can pull their fire trucks out. Okay. So uh, the fire department was located where it is now. Yes. Uh, uh, they had a volunteer fire department. Would you like to tell us about that? Uh, they had a volunteer fire department. We had uh, many a fundraiser. Uh, that one fundraiser, we worked real hard at it and sold a lot of sausage wraps. And, and at the end of the day, I think they made 50 some odd cents. Uh, and we changed methods after that. They really just didn't work out where they made a lot of money at some of those fundraisers. Uh, so they, they did a lot of things different after that one. Uh, they had some great folks. I was one of the volunteers, and that, that was some of the most exciting times, uh, being able to drive the fire truck. And uh, Most of the people worked in Austin that were with the fire department. So there was very few people out here that would be available. Uh, and they had phones in people's houses, and uh, that's how the, somebody had to be around the phone at all times if somebody called in a fire. So they, all these volunteers were donating their time or devoting time to stay at home to, so that somebody would be at the phone to answer it. Otherwise, the fire department was not coming. Uh, and that was some exciting times. During the day, uh, on some of the occasions, I would take the fire truck out and I'd be the only one. Uh, and I'd drape the hose around the side while I was driving and squirting on the side of the road for like a, a fire on the side of the road. One trip to the high school, there was a fire there, and I drove the fire truck. I ended up arresting the person that started the fire, and there I was with him and the fire out and a fire truck, and I didn't want to drive the fire truck with uh, a prisoner. <laughs> so I, I didn't think that would quite look right, so I had to get somebody to come up there and drive the fire truck and bring me a police car. I, at the time, I had another officer at the time. Oh, well, that, that, that's exciting. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, so then you moved to Pflugerville. Where did you live when you came to Pflugerville? I lived in Gatlinburg, and I had a great opportunity to live between the hookers and the boozers. Excellent place for the police chief to be. Uh, and uh, those families uh, later, uh, uh, Chuck Hooker became the police chief uh, in the yes. future days, and uh, Elaine Boozer was actually the president of the school board. That's correct. I lived next to great people. <laughs> Uh, you said you lived in Gatlinburg. That was one of the first subdivisions. Uh, do you remember Gatlinburg being built? I remember lots of it being built. Only phase one and two were really being built at the time, or two and three. Uh, and then the economy kind of hit bad in 1985, and it stopped. Uh, there was very little building going on at the time. Uh, the city had the sewer plant. That was our first sewer plant was uh, uh, on the edge of Gatlinburg. And I guess during the scope of that, I was able to go into every house that was being built at one time or another just to visit with the builders and the people, and it was a great time. Um, and how it grew, and the Justice Center was eventually uh, built. Um. We started out in, uh, in City Hall, 
and then they remodeled City Hall because the back room is at one time was uh, when it was a Honda shop had it. That's where they did the mechanical work, and uh, they expanded it, and we I took over that back room, uh, and. One of the things about police work, you always end up with a lot of evidence that it just hangs around. And I needed more room for even just to, to store those kind of things. And I had another part of the room where we filled it up with evidence. Later on, when the, uh, the city started to dispatch for the fire department, I moved into what used to be the old fire station. Well, it's all tore down now, but it was right on the corner of uh, uh, Railroad and Pecan. And it was an interesting building because they built the building, then poured the concrete, and the floors were always shifting and moving up and down, and, and uh, there was always cracks somewhere. Uh, but that was our second home, and I think we stayed there until somewhere around 92. And then we moved into uh, the C City Hall's current location. And we stayed there until I think it was 2000, and that's when they built the new city or new police department. Um, also, during your time, uh, the streets have changed because in 1965, they, uh, there were zero dollars in the budget and uh, the streets were maintained by the county. So uh, let's, let's look at how the streets and the roads have changed over time. The, the roads, uh, they were pretty rough roads in the old down, in the old part of Pflugerville. And they had a lot of potholes uh, and the, uh, the, it was peeling. Uh, off the sides where people had driven off, and they had a bond issue. The first one failed, and then the second one passed. I don't recall the dates of uh, those, but it passed, and uh, everybody looked like they wanted Pflugerville to be a, a great town with good streets. That was very important to the people back then. And uh, at the time, Gatlinburg had nice new streets, and I think it had, took a lot of... It, the biggest problem back then was taxes. Uh, Pflugerville had very few business. It was just very few business at all, and, and the city had to operate on rooftops and taxing people. Uh, it wasn't even, uh, Pflugerville was close to 5,000 population before we even got a Dairy Queen. And they're with Texas City didn't have a Dairy Queen, but Pflugerville did not have a Dairy Queen mm -hmm. uh, until, until we were about 5,000 population. And there was very little opportunities out here for shopping or eating. U Totem was the big business in town. Uh, they were open 24 hours a day. Uh, you'd see kids going up there and they would get something to nuke or microwave there. Uh, and that was, a, that was our big eating establishment at times when, when nothing else was open. Uh, so when they put in the streets, was there uh, any discomfort to the citizens? Yes, uh, I think the people didn't want to raise taxes on them. They didn't want to do it, and it, it really took, I think, a lot of the newer people that moved to town to actually push that bond issue through uh, because they wanted good streets. They wanted Pflugerville to, to be a great town as well. And, uh, and so we were able to get all the streets put in uh, and curbs and gutters and made, this, uh, made the downtown area really nice. Uh, Pecan Street used to be a two-lane yes. road, and that's a state highway? Yes, state highway. And so it was expanded. Tell us a little bit about that process. Well, the first part, I guess that was one of the first things the council assigned me to do was stop parking on Pecan Street. Uh, there was always parking on Pecan Street, mainly in front of the tavern area, uh, which made it real difficult to squeeze through there because people uh, would drive through there pretty quick. But there was parking on both sides of the street. And then the state came along and they uh, decided to widen it. There was a lot of discussion over uh, a four lane or a three lane with the turn lane or, and at one time they actually wanted to put a five lane road through and they wanted to take out the buildings on the south side of the street. And that wouldn't have quite worked out. They, they would have taken half of Pflugerville's businesses away had they done that. And we didn't have a lot to share or, or to lose. Uh, but that was one of the plans at one time and then they did back off to four and they said there'd be plenty of room, those buildings could stay. Uh, it would just be real dangerous to step off the curb into that street, though. Uh, so it, it was an interesting time watching them try to build this, the road through Pflugerville and, and get a, a real consensus, because a lot of people don't like the change. They don't want to lose their home, and, and Pflugerville has always meant something about being home and, and a small town, and I guess that kind of changed us a little bit, but 
Pflugerville is still a pretty great place, and I think everybody still looks at it as a small town. Um, let's talk about being a dog catcher. Uh, yeah, that was the worst job of all, being a dog catcher. I, would, I may have given it second thoughts if I knew I was going to have to be the dog catcher, too. Uh, but we had to catch them dogs. They, they were loose. It, it had, had to do, somebody had to do them. So uh, we went and caught dogs, and we kept them uh, for the right number of days. And, and thankfully, we got a lot of them back home to people. Uh, but proactive dog enforcement does help reduce the amount of dogs running loose. And that's always been a especially a walking town. Everybody wants to walk and everybody needs that opportunity to be safe. So it was a, it was a good thing to do. It was just, I don't like catching dogs. <laughs> uh, one of the things that uh, Pflugerville today is noted for uh, is the extensive uh, trail system where people can uh, walk, run, jog, uh, bike, etc. And I think the citizens feel uh, very safe uh, getting on the trails and uh, that again is a compliment to the uh, enforcement. But if you talk about the trails just a little bit and any experiences. I, I guess the trails were somewhat controversial at first. You know, they, they saw them as a maintenance issue, cost issue, all these other things. But I think the, we had some mayors and planning and zoning group uh, council members that really worked hard. They had a great vision for Pflugerville back then to build these trails and keep them connected and keep people walking. And, uh, you know, the credit has to go to those, those guys, the, the council and the mayors that pushed for these trails uh, and find a way to make it happen. And they did. And, uh, and they're still doing it to this day. Uh, Deutschen Fest began in 1976, and it's been an annual Pflugerville event. Uh, as a city employee, I know there was a lot of preparation. so. Talk about uh, your job or your perspective of early Deutschen Fest and then uh, over the years, tell us how it evolved. It, Deutschen Fest was just started with a bunch of great volunteers. I wasn't there for the beginning part of it, but I knew as time goes on, it was, it was just volunteers that were organizing this. They were taking the calls at home, setting up, the, you know, planning for the booths, planning for the parade. There was a, a chairman for each. Uh, it you, was started out as a, a big bulky type thing and it was narrowed down to uh, a few uh, chairmen who were in charge of the booths or in charge of this and it's really improved. A lot of changes have come to Deutschen Fest. When it first started the fire department charged a uh, dollar per car to park around the festival and uh, everything else was free and that was their big, one of their big source of fundraisers. Back in the, those days, they parked on a, uh, Leon and Gladys Fluger's land, and they always let the fire department do those things, where they could charge for them. They had two gates. Um, and of course, that one gate was always one of my responsibilities. At 10 o'clock, I had to go close that gate to the park. Uh, when I was working, in the morning, it yes, and in the morning, I would have to open it back up, or someone else did. But I had to close that gate at 10 o'clock during the week. Uh, <laughs> just to keep people out of the park. So we had a curfew on it. But, but back to Deutsche Fest. It, and it just really started great. I mean, they did some of them downtown, and if it rained, we would move back from the, the Pfluger Park to downtown. Um, and it's really grown into a great uh, group of people that are running it. They maintain uh, what they did last year. They they keep good uh, after action plans and looked at the things that went right and went, went wrong. And it's just really involved to a, a very good uh, or a group of people. Uh, so how much did they charge for parking? A dollar, dollar a car. Okay. So that was and you could put lots of people in the car if you wanted to. And, uh, but <laughs> it was dollar a car. You could walk in there and it would be no charge. But, so did y'all, uh, your department then had to put up the barricades uh, for the parade and? Uh... Yes, mostly. Yeah, it was mainly us. We would, uh, at the time we had, we were holding it on, on 1825 and that was quite a task to block 1825 off for a parade. And finally we got enough streets where we could, uh, we were able to take it off of 1825 because that was a real chore. Uh, and the constables were there involved. Uh, we had to borrow the cones. So on that Friday night, I'd go to Georgetown, load them up in my truck, and carry cones back. 
so that we could block things off. And then come Monday morning, return them back to the state for using their cones and blocking things off. As far as barricades, the ah, city didn't own maybe three or four barricades. I mean, we were tiny to have that many people coming to town and, and uh, doing those events. Um, when you have large crowds, that's always, um, you have to have a safety plan uh, and people and what ifs. So uh, tell us how you, uh, again, over the years dealt with uh, crowd control. Well, over the years, I guess we started out uh, one parade, one town, one policeman. <laughs> that was plenty good, and we've kind of grown from that. It was, uh, uh, it was pretty easy to work with the folks, and they'd, you'd always have help there if you needed it. Uh, and we did make plans for it. Uh, the fire department and, and the city and the, all the other members were very active in, in making these things happen and providing safety for everyone. Uh, it was really a great joint effort. And, of course, now that we've grown a lot, it made it a lot easier because you've got more uh, officers available to you. And, of course, your volunteer pool has increased. There's a lots of volunteers that work that festival, lots of them that work the gates. Uh, we tried different things over the years, and one of them was they put up a fence all the way around it, and they were going to charge, and that was our first year, and it worked pretty well. One year they charged, and it, it, they had the, they, the, the vendors a little bit different, but that was a lot of work. We counted coupons all Sunday morning at the time because it started out as a, a one-day event just on Saturday. And then as time went along, with it, it would expand it to uh, the three-day event. So it starts on Friday evening and through Sunday night. Yes, Sunday or Sunday evening. evening. Yes, Sunday afternoon. Um, they had horses in the parade. Yes, they did. And you had designated volunteers to be pooper scoopers. Yes, we even had some pooper scoopers, and they dressed as clowns, and one of them was a city employee. And uh, I think they loved that role, and they, they, were, they were the coolest guys in the world. And again, uh, a consistent participant in the Deutschenfest has been the Shriners with yes. their little cars, and uh, they come out from Austin and participate. Yes, at, at least they were. I, I have not seen parades lately, but I, I think they, uh, they're still active in it. Okay, um, let's go then to some of the characters in town um, that you might recall, either businessmen or citizens or, or regulars that were around. Well, we certainly had our characters, but they were all fun, wonderful characters. Uh, I guess most of my thoughts always go back to the early councils and the people that served on them. Uh, and each year it would seem like they would just develop a bigger and better vision for Pflugerville. Um, and we just had some great folks in town. Mr. I.B. Krinke. I do remember him. He was, he, was, he was not uh, on the council at the time when I took over. Mr. Bowles was the mayor. Uh, and I have to thank these early councils for giving me an opportunity to grow. Uh, a lot of times these little cities, they want to get involved in the police and telling them how to do things. And, I, and they actually gave me an opportunity to, to do it maybe Andy Griffin style and add a little twist to that and, and yet enforce the law. I mean, that's still important to you uh, to be able to do that. And so the early councils, they were, uh, they gave me the chance and they asked me to explain, you know, which is a lot better than telling me this is the way you got to do it. Because sometimes well-intentioned people do not necessarily know the law and what should be done or how to do it. And they, they gave me the opportunity to grow and explain and I did grow a lot with them also. Uh, I grew to understand what they are, uh, what they wanted. Uh, so do you remember some of the business people? Was Mr. Becker still uh, had his filling station or the U-Totem was already here? The U-Totem was here uh, when I got here. Uh, U-Totem was, was the big hangout for everyone. There was a big night for Halloween at, at U-Totem store. Everybody, at that time, everybody enjoyed eggs and they would throw those eggs into U-Totem store and for weeks after that, it would smell like rotten eggs. They couldn't get them all out. It was, <laughs> it was, it was really a big time for all the goblins to come out because the goblins came out in Pflugerville on Halloween night, so and it was a big, pranks. Uh, the excellent pranks. Yes, there Tell there was us a about lot. Some of those. Well, so that was the uh, I guess the funniest ones was the uh, the throwing of the eggs, and, the, and you know I, I could sit there all night and I wasn't going to catch them because they they were really fast on the eggs and they were fast on the water balloons. 
Uh, they were fast to crawl the water tire and do some painting on it too. And you know, no matter how hard you try, they would they'd still sneak by me. Uh, there was a lot of papering back in those. They loved to paper the high school. Call it paper. Oh, paper, and, paper. and they would, you know, as a rule, most of the time they were very good about what they wrote with so it could actually be cleaned up. Uh, there, was, there was some vandalism that was a little harder to clean, but most of it was pretty clean fun. Uh, and that was a hard tradition to break was the papering of the high school. They really loved to do that. And uh, uh, one night I, I just missed them. And uh, I went up and cleaned the school. You know, I don't know if anybody in the world knows that, but I picked up all the paper. I cleaned the windows. And they had nothing to enjoy come mor next morning because it was cleaned. And uh, <laughs> I was kind of embarrassed that I, I let it happen, yet they didn't get to enjoy it after I cleaned it. You know, so I went through hard work to clean that building, for, to clean the high school for them. <laughs> So that, uh, that even pervades today, uh, you think about a lot of the criminal acts, uh, even though they're more severe probably than the papering, but sometimes they perform these acts so that they get the attention, whether it's uh, newsworthy and they, they want to see what they've done that everybody sees. Yes, a lot of that, you know, they enjoy seeing the graffiti and, and I guess you could say this was graffiti, but it said seniors 1982 on it uh, instead of anything else. They were more proud of that. And, that, and uh, you know, they really took, I think, a lot of care not to destroy property mm -hmm. other than throw a lot of paper out and, and uh, paint on the windows. Um, we're going to go to um, a more modern time. Uh, uh, you became um, manager of the city, I think. And uh, during um, the last uh, decade or so, we've uh, had Lake Pflugerville to come uh, open, and there was the construction of that. Uh, do you have any recollections on the plan and um, the building of Lake Pflugerville and to where it is today, where it is a recreation and providing the uh, water? There was a lot of effort put into uh, Lake Pflugerville, and a lot of it was done before I uh, took over that position. Lake Pflugerville and, and many of these other things that were done. Uh, they did a great job on it. They did a wonderful study on it before they, they went off in this direction. Uh, that was one of the, if you're going to have good quality growth, and that's always been important for Pflugerville is to have good quality growth. Um, and you can't control your growth if you can't control water or wastewater. Uh, you got to control something in there and you can't go out and annex everything because growth should really pay for itself and you start annexing you're really stretching yourself even thinner. And Pflugerville, that's, that's always been a challenge here, is the money. Uh, because we lack the base, the tax base. Uh, and you really could, it, the taxes would really, really be high if, if they had, wouldn't have had these uh, opportunities of the stores coming in. Um, so there was a grant that was available with the Lake Pflugerville project? No, no, it was not. It was all the, the city had to build, uh, had to raise the rates on everybody on water and wastewater, and they did that for a couple of years to get enough money in the in there to bond them. Uh, they, it, something to do with bonding, you have to have enough ca uh, capabilities to to support it. So they raised the rates and uh, and built it. And the lake was a wonderful project. We were able to uh, go out and. Hide, you know, hide brush piles out there and we brought round uh, concrete containers out there for the fish to have a habitat and uh, actually I have a map on that thing where it shows where all the fish are at but I won't share it. <laughs> yeah I had an advantage but I, I've only fished out there one time with my grandson. Uh, a couple of those people have found those those locations and, and there's some very good fishing places out there. The trail we were able to get the trail and at the time we were hearing, we have such a beautiful lake. Why don't we have some more amenities out there? Well, the city was pretty short of money at that time to have any amenities out there. And through a grant uh, through the LCRA, uh, we were able to put the trail around it. And, and through the parks, and well, we put some of it was LCRA money, and some of them we got from the the parks, uh, state parks department to get the trail out there. Uh, and that really worked out well. And it was a good beginning. Uh, we got donations to build a lot of those piers that were out there. It was through a lot of, Private from system. individual donations to, to build those piers. Uh, otherwise, uh, they wouldn't have been there at that time. So we had a, 
a great, uh, great thing there, but we just didn't have the funds to do anything with it other than uh, a little at a time. Um, they then started the uh, Firecracker July 4th celebration. Yes. Uh, and that was uh, another uh, opportunity for citizens to celebrate, but uh, again, it took some intense planning, particularly on the uh, traffic side. Yes, on the, for, uh, the first year, it was, uh, it was a pretty tough Fourth of July, there was a lot of folks out there uh, and no place to park. And we learned, just just like always, there was learn, we learned things that went wrong on that one and it made it better and better. Uh, just like Deutschen Fest, everything, everything has been looked at, reviewed, and Pflugerville has been great about learning from their mistakes and not doing it again. Uh. You were talking about uh, annexing. Part of uh, the growth of Pflugerville has been the um, information of the ETJ and talking to uh, landowners, property owners, to the uh, uh, outside of the city limits to plan for the future. Talk about that process. Well, at the time, we Pflugerville was. To, you have to main. You have to be able to control your control something to make it uh, have good growth. And Pflugerville didn't control the water out there. They didn't control the wastewater. But Pflugerville was really set on the desire to control growth. We're not talking mansions. We're not talking extravagant things. We're talking about making sure there's parkland dedication. We're talking about good quality roads being built out there to Pflugerville standards so we don't have to go out and rebuild them. Because uh, that happened a lot when, there's, when it didn't have our type of control. And there was a lot of houses that we that were built that we that weren't being inspected. They weren't being built probably to a good code. So it was very important for Pflugerville to go out there and control this area and make sure that it's built quality for everybody. Uh, and it does sometimes cause a hardship on the home, on the landowner because he wants to sell his land, uh, and we put these stipulations on it. But what we do is help maintain the value of that land, maintain the value of the, the value of the houses. And so the city wanted to move west. And we went out and talked to all the people out there about signing up and agreeing to come into city uh, ETJ. And uh, this really helped. Uh, I guess had that happened many years ago, Pflugerville's ETJ would have been a little bit different on the east side of town, or excuse me, the west side of town, uh, where we, at the time when I started here, the Pflugerville Stadium, the football stadium, only a few feet of it was inside the city. The rest of it was in Austin's ETJ. At Gatlinburg, the, the Austin had to release the land that the sewer plant was built on because that's how small we were. Uh, it was just, and, and so it was really critical that Pflugerville find a way to get the right kind of growth out here because we saw that uh, good growth affects not just the people in the city, but it affects the schools. And that was always a key part for Pflugerville's thinking was to help the schools out. And uh, I really do hope we've done that over the years of helping the school by maintaining a, a great community. I like the phrase that you've used, we've learned from our mistakes and we do better the next time. And that's a perfect example there also on that, uh, the ETJ. Um, SH-130 has been a, an economic engine and a game changer in the Pflugerville arena. So talk about uh, when it was the first concept, when you first heard the concept of SH-130 uh, up until actually driving on it. Oh, gee, the first concept of 130 was probably when I got here. But at the same time, everybody was talking about how Disneyland was coming out, too. I haven't seen them show up either. So a lot of times these things were where they would start talking about it. And it was supposed to go down the old railroad. Uh, that's where 130 was, or that main road was going to be. And it's been moved back and forth, and, and then it finally happened. You know, I, I really don't know how it really happened, and they pulled it off other than the, the state pushing for it, and they did the toll. I don't know that it would be out there had it not been for a toll road. I don't know where they'd have found the money to do those things, because it did cost them. And they moved fast. Uh, the TxDOT really built that highway fast, when you look at it, they built it pretty darn good. They, they really made a good road. Uh, Pflugerville saw right up front that this was going to be the economics for Pflugerville. This was going to be a place where we're going to change that tax rate. Uh, and 
early plantings, with the, the state was great about giving the, and the owners, of course, wanted the, the entrances and exits uh, in part for their, their giving the land or selling the land uh, so that we were able to have a good frontage road on the side of the side of 130. And a lot of plantings went into it. The city had to tackle water. At the time, it was a, uh, the rural water supply was, uh, it was in their service area, so we had to work to get that over to, our, uh, to the city so that we could provide enough water where you could actually have good water pressure in that area to support business. Uh, the rural water supply, great organization, but they were not in a position to supply uh, major development, especially like this one coming on or even uh, uh, the existing uh, like at Stone Hill. Stone Hill, yes. They couldn't have provided that. So the city worked real hard to obtain that right away, or that the, the certified area from uh, the wa rural water supply, and that helped open it up. And there was a lot of 130 meetings with these other cities talking about what they're doing and how they're planning it. And the city of Pflugerville had already planned and had all this in place while these other cities were talking about how they were going to control it. And Pflugerville did a very good uh, a planning uh, on that road and for what kind of business and, and industry, and what was going to be allowed and how there was going to be done way before that road was finished. And they really did a great job on it. Uh, the planning, uh, was it the Planning and Zoning Commission, again, that was made up of citizens, or was it and the leaders in the city, and then was PCDC involved? At the time, PCDC was... Yes, they were, well, they came involved, but really the whole thing was everybody's goal was to make that good for us, to make it help pay. Uh, I don't think of anybody that wasn't on, on, on the wagon with us trying to make this happen. Uh, and there's nearly, uh, I think, five exits for Pflugerville yes. off of that, which is unusual. Um, yes, it is. Uh, from all the way from Georgetown to Seguin, which is the length of yes. the H-130. And so that was foresight. Yes. And a lot of that had to do with, uh, I think, the, the owners of the land as much as it did anyone else. They worked real hard to, uh, they had a good vision. Uh, they had been in the community for years as well. And, uh, you know, they did a, a great job of, of uh, helping to get those, those uh, frontage roads on there. Um, citizen participation and volunteerism is, is important in a community. And there are numerous commissions within the city that uh, citizens can serve on. Uh, you want to talk about those different commissions or how citizens can really get involved? They, and they, they do make a difference. You know, it's, it's so important that they become a part of the, uh, the goings on. And we have the, the library board. We have, uh, uh, you could serve with parks, I mean, with the uh, parks department, uh, planning and zoning, the board of adjustments. Uh, you can be a citizen's on patrol, and there are just tons of opportunities to get out there and be a part of the uh, the community and do these things. And it's it's such a learning opportunity as well to really understand about the uh, what's going on. And it's not just open for older people. It's a great opportunity for the kids to come get involved in things like Deutsch and Fest and uh, simple things like kid fish out at the at the lake. Uh, that's one of the events they hold annually, and you know if you can ha take a fish off a line and help a kid throw a, uh, throw his worm out into the water, what a great opportunity uh, to help these children do those things. So there's great opportunities for volunteering, and uh, you know t this United States and Texas, all of this was built on volunteers, and the need of volunteers is still there today, and. Uh, you have to share your points of view and your ideas with, with the people that are here and, and, and make it a better place. And by volunteering, sometimes they uh, acquire ownership uh, in the project or in their city. Um. Yes, and I, I think that's very true. You know, I, I, I've talked to a lot of the people that have volunteered over the years, and uh, you would think they built some of this community. And you know what? They're right. They did. They built a lot of this community through volunteering. Uh, and you start with the mayor and council. That's one of your you know, biggest volunteers. You, the school board. Think of all the volunteers that it takes to make these things work. Uh, and just people with a vision that care about a community and uh, all of them volunteers. 
uh, when Pflugerville was smaller, it was known for that small town feeling and the family feeling. And I think that's uh, something that's been projected into the future as a desire and by being involved in some of these, maybe. How do you say the word Pflugerville and not think of family? I mean, they just go together. I mean, when you say Pflugerville, you're thinking family. I think Pflugerville is going to be a much larger community someday. But how can you still say, I live in Pflugerville and not think of family? Uh, it, it's in your heart. You know, you can get to 100, 200,000 people, but it's still in your heart. Uh, and the community is working real hard to maintain those kind of things. They're working real hard for the, the trails, the parks, the opportunities for the kids to uh, grow a safe community. All those things work hand in hand and uh, well even uh, uh, planting trees and there's an Arbor Day I think yes. where people uh, get very involved. Uh, there's the, uh, and this may go back to your early days there, Neighborhood Watch and are that uh, the night out, what is that called? National night out where they, uh, they have the parties and uh, they it's an opportunity to get your neighbors over you really shouldn't be a stranger to your neighbor. You know, bring your neighbor over and talk to your neighbor and visit with them. And this gives an opportunity not only for the neighbors to come over and be a part of the community, because sometimes instead of being a stranger, they become a, a part of the, of the community and the neighborhood, and then bring the police, the fire department, city employees, council, all of them go out and it becomes a, you do better when you are not a stranger to these people. Another big volunteer effort, I think it was, was uh, how the Fallen Warrior Memorial yes. happened. Uh, can you go back to uh, where the seed was planted and then to the reality of that? They organized a group of people to uh, do the Fallen Warrior here, uh, a Memorial. I don't recall all the people that were on it. Uh, at the time, we, we were a part of uh, Pflugerville, Friends for Pflugerville's Future. Uh, it was a 501c3 that we had organized, and we helped bring in the money through there so that it could, uh, people had a place to donate it and were involved in it as well. And the uh, people really opened their hearts and, and, and made that into a, uh, a fine uh, memorial. Um, likewise, uh, Pflugger Hall, uh, I don't know if you remember the building of Pflugger Hall, but that was done with uh, a lot of volunteer yes. labor and the volunteer fire department. So. Uh, share any ideas on how it, uh, from ground up, became a reality. Gee, that's, that's been a long time ago, too. Uh, it, there was always a vision for Pflugerville Fire Department to do that, uh, along with the Pfluger family. And the Pfluger family was a very active participant in it, and uh, it, there was just a lot of efforts going into it uh, from all the volunteers. I guess that's, that may be a better question to ask some of the uh, the firemen or Ron on, on, on how it became about, because uh, it's been so long ago for me. <laughs> of course, it may be long ago for him now, too. <laughs> um, in your early years, the gin was still operating. Yes. And uh, so as uh, an officer, you saw agricultural equipment uh, that would feel like they had the right of way on the road. Oh, yes, uh, so yes. So you might share how that yeah. uh, the, it's It was a... Uh, You'd go through, and it was a pretty dusty place when they were ginning cotton, pretty pretty thick. And there was also a fertilizer uh, right next to it. Uh, but it was very agricultural out here. The people that lived out here, most of them also had land on the side, or a lot of them had land on the side. Uh, so there was very much agriculture. Uh, we chased lots of cows, always getting loose on the cow. We chased them sometimes as much as we did uh, dogs because there were so many so many of them around there was many people that still had a lot of chickens on their place uh, a couple of them had horses and it was very much a, a rural community at that time so if you uh, look back on your uh, life career in Pflugerville what would you let's talk about some of the highest uh, accomplishments, our memories, and then some of the real, real challenges. In fact, those one at a time. Oh, gee, the high spots. I, I have so many, I wouldn't know where to begin. Well, just tell us all of them. <laughs> you don't have enough time. <laughs> Everything was so much fun out here. 
it was so much fun to be able to know these people and work with them. Uh, you, you did get to see, when they had a tragedy, it, it, it hit your life too, because it was, you became friends with all these people. There's, there's a lot of good folks out here that uh, you've, you've bled for them as well as anything else. I mean, they are, they're, uh, they're, they're just some really good people out here. And there was a lot of high spots. There was, there's a, it's, but I guess just watching the growth, the good growth of Pflugerville and how it's, you know, we, as big as we've gotten, some things have not changed. This is still a good community. And uh, there's a lot of people involved in it. You know, maybe some of the, some things have changed, but not, not, the, not the hearts of people. It's, it's still a great people. Place. So I don't know how to narrow down one high spot, uh, other than just being having the opportunity to have been a part of it, uh, to be involved in all of this stuff, and uh, the opportunity to to serve with so many different people. Low spots. I have to think back on you know one of the hardest parts out here was always the old age old money. Flickerville just did, it was hard to have uh, support things out here when you don't have the money. And Pflugerville did not have a, a strong tax base other than houses. We were faced by a lot of growth, lots of needs. Uh, we had a lot of people that moved out here and didn't quite understand why you couldn't do some things. Well, you just can't afford to do them all at one time. But Pflugerville just stayed with it and kept after it. You know, it was years before we had, a, had an HEB store here. Uh, there had been some opportunities, but we had a lot of not in my neighborhood type things. They did not want that grocery store in their neighborhood. And really, I think even HEB faced a lot of those issues. But the store people came out here and worked with the, the neighbors. They talked about what impact it would have. Uh, there was a lot of when Walmart was going to come out. They weren't going to, a lot of people did not want Walmart to come. But Walmart is probably the first step to growth. And once Walmart came out, somehow somebody sent up the signal, it were open for business. And the citizens and the Walmart people were able to sit down and work out some different things to, to how to make Walmart store look different. And uh, they did it. I mean, you, you could, you, they sat down and make, made it work. Uh, instead of just the old box that you saw in a lot of places, Walmart, uh, they changed and made it look like a nicer building. And uh, I think Pflugerville has benefited by this. Uh, because we're now we can build roads. Now we can do something with that beautiful parkland we have there that sat idle. Uh, they can do something with it. Any words of wisdom to the citizens uh, and are to the uh, city and the celebration? Oh, I would just say good luck on the next 50. I think it's going to be a it's going to be a great 50. The next one. Uh, it's so much fun to have seen all these things and been so involved in all these things. Uh, uh, get involved. Be a part of the community. There's a lot of fun out there doing it. Uh, I don't know of any of these folks who have served. You know, they may get, gee, they wouldn't listen to me, or uh, I try to bring them a good idea. Ideas take time. And Pflugerville wasn't built overnight although it seems like it was because it went so fast. But man, there was lots of ideas and there were lots of ideas that were kicked around and changed and tailored to meet the other people's thoughts. And it turned out to be a, a fine town because of that. Uh, I thought of one other question. So were there any, um, for instance, a weather event that triggered uh, an emergency event uh, or like a snowstorm or a flood uh, that nature? Uh, most of those, uh, they happened, and I, I know the fire department was involved in quite a few rescues. Uh, we had one windstorm that, oh, there was trees all over this town, everywhere. And just pitched in, and everyone started hauling the trees away. Mm -hmm. uh, they were hauled to a location. Later on, they were all ground up into mulch. So everybody had an opportunity at some good mulch. Uh, but it seems like every tragedy, we, we learn how to do, uh, find our way out of it, and we find something useful to have 
uh, done with the like the material from the trees, as bad as those trees were torn down. We found a, a great use for those trees at the time. Do you remember a snowstorm where the uh, city hall was impacted? Oh, yes, I do. Uh, I, they were, the roof was caving in. But I only vaguely remember how it was dealt with at that time. I, 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 it was my early days. I don't, I don't recall it. I think I'm getting old. And uh, Gillian Creek could flood it. Oh, Gillian Creek could definitely come out of its bank. I don't remember anybody, uh, any house or anything that was flooded, but it could certainly come out of the banks. And uh, back when we were a small community, everybody knew, don't be driving over those things. But as we started changing and new people moved in, we, Pflugerville finally had to get some barricades to uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> block off some of these things. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about the swimming pool when it was built? Were you around when that was yes. uh, happened? Yes, it was. That was a. Uh, but I, I don't know that much of the details on it because I wasn't okay. that involved with the with the swimming pool. Very good. Okay. Uh, if you don't have anything else, I think we're probably. No. Do you have any other questions? Do you see anything else in your notes you want to add? Ah, oh, I think that's. Pretty much got it. Okay, very good. Well, we appreciate your stories and. Uh, <laughs> One thing I don't want to. Uh, David, it's good that you could join us this afternoon, and we're going to talk about some key characters in the city of Pflugerville. And uh, one was a couple, uh, Willard and Camille Pfluger. Those, those were uh, Willard and Camille. They were two of the first people I met here in town. Uh, he had the where the Texaco station is. Uh, he had the front part and Camille was there. He also had the grain elevator. Uh, and those were two of the best people. Every year, Camille brought some feed down for the dogs in the dog shelter. And Willard, he learned I, had, I needed to get some cows to sell them. And that man showed up and helped me haul them to Taylor. That's the kind of guy he was. And he would not take a penny for helping me haul him cattle. Uh, now the first person I met when I come to Pflugerville, we had just bought our land out on Weiss Lane. and. I guess I was away from the farm too long and forgot about that slick mud and I drove off into it. And H.L. Weiss showed up with his tractor and pulled me out. And that was one of the first people I met in town was him or in the area. And uh, he pulled me out and again, he wouldn't accept anything. He was just, he was H.L. Weiss, one of the nicest guys in the world like he, like he is always. Um, then I guess the next person I got to meet was John Pfluger and uh, Kareen Hooker when they were at the old bank, uh, the one on the corner. Uh, I had pulled in there, we were gonna live out here, so we wanted to start a bank account, and there they were. And uh, John was such a great guy. Um, later on, I wanted to borrow some money, uh, and it wasn't all that much. And I said, I can't get to town because I'm working uh, shift work. And he said, well, come by, by that time they had moved. And by that time I came by the drive-in bank, and he had the loan ready for me to sign. All I had to do was sign that loan, and he put the money in my account, and it was that easy. I mean, he was, and he was a, a lifelong friend as well. He, was, he always went out of his way to, to, to do things and help me out. Uh, another set of people was Frank and Lynn Gaddy. They had a, a little welding shop, and they sold feed on the side right behind Wilder Pfluger where the Texaco station was. Later on, it was converted to a, a car wash, I mean, a washateria. But they had that place for years, and I pulled in there, and he welded me a rack on my truck. And ever since then, he's been one of the best guys with me forever. And, and Lynn, they were really good people to me. Where did their business move then? Then they moved down to where the car lot is now, and right by the old bar, there's a barber shop there. And they moved into that, I think that was, uh, I think that was Mr. Sagert's building, Buck Sagert, who was another great guy. He was on the council at, uh, during the time I was here. And all of this was before I ever came to work for the city. My next man I got to meet was Clements Whelan. Now that guy was great. Uh, I brought in my little, it was a Chevy Love pickup with an Izu, Izu motor in it. And he said, well, I've never done metric before. He said, but I've been wanting to try. So he had to overhaul my truck. And I came back in and his wife was, I think it was Bertha, was standing into the background and she comes walking out kind of slowly and quietly and hands him a can of nuts and bolts. And he says, 
yeah, these went to your truck somewhere, but I don't know where they went. And it was to me, it was one of the funniest things in the world. And he says, but the truck runs great. And he was right. The man did a wonderful job. And he said, I, that's my first metric job. And he said, I'll never do one again. And he enjoyed it and had a great time doing it. Now that was the Wheeling Garage. Yes, it's Wheeling and Garage. They, uh, also eventually opened up a parts store. Didn't they, they had the parts store there also uh, at that time. And uh, I brought everything to him. He was, he was, uh, he gave you the kind of care that you really want from a mechanic, somebody that cares about what he was doing. Even though he brought me out a can of nuts and bolts at the end of it, it was still okay. And we all got a kick out of it. And uh, it, it was really a, it was a fun thing to watch him talk about how he tackled that metric nuts and bolts on that truck and made it work. And it, it really ran great. It, it was still ugly though, but it ran great. And uh, Bertha was the bookkeeper maybe? I think she did some of the books and probably kept him in line too. I'm not sure, <laughs> but those two belonged together. They were a wonderful team when they worked together and it was just so much enjoyment to go into that shop. Uh, all of these brought, people brought me such enjoyment uh, coming out. Another one I got to meet real early was Robert Weiss. And I don't think enough people are really aware of some of the things that that guy did for the community. That was back in the days when everybody have a, had to have a phone in their house for the fire department. And Robert gave up many a Sunday and a Saturday staying at home because somebody answered that phone. Uh, because that was the only way to communicate with the fire department. And he, was, he is an awesome guy. He really did a lot for the community and, and for the fire department. Uh, later on, he was even on the city council. Uh, another person, uh, I think I've mentioned him a little bit, uh, and that's Clarence Bowles, and of course everybody knows Clarence. Uh, he was a great boss for me. Uh, we t were able to talk, we became good friends, and uh, you know, I, I can't say enough good about what he did for me and allowed me the opportunity to work and grow, and, and we just had a great times together. One of the other early characters was George Fluger and his meat market. I loved going in there. It was a, when he made barbecue, this town really grew a lot that day because there were so many people coming from everywhere to eat his barbecue. And he was served on butcher paper. Uh, I watched him even make his sausage and he, he was a good sausage man. He really did it fast. I'd never seen it done quite like that. Uh, and he could make some great sausage. If you wanted a, uh, a steak, he would go under the cool or a locker where the coal is and he would take the a big calf you know the the whole hind quarter and he'd come out there and cut you off some steak and it was such a neat sight to see something like that you know where he would just actually throw it over his shoulder and carry it out and cut you off what you wanted uh, and he was just an awesome man his business was in uh, one of the original buildings the yes. Sager, uh, um, store and had wood floors yes had wood floors in it and he had his pit inside. Yes, he did. Uh, and then, no, I guess he no, was, it was outside. outside he had some on the inside, if I'm not mistaken. It, 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 you know, memory kind of fades after a while, but I think he had them in both places. And then right next to him was Knievel's Tavern. Mm -hmm. And that was another great guy. Uh, tough, as everybody knew him by, he was a wonderful person. And then later on, he moved across the street uh, uh, to his final uh, uh, place where he was at. And that, you know, I could go on and on. There were so many good people in this town, but I just had to mention those few. Uh, you know, we got the Winnie Mays and the Jack Merchants and uh, uh, wonderful people. They, they were always here for you, always great people. Glenn Merchantson, I got to know him real good at nighttime. It seemed like he was my guardian angel. I would stop a car and then I would notice down the street he was stopping and it looked like he was watching to make sure I was okay. You know, maybe he was just watching to see what kind of things I was doing, but he always gave me that feeling that he was kind of my guardian angel when he would park down the street, his big old beautiful Lincoln that he had, and uh, he always stopped there and just kind of kept an eye on things. Um, Glenn also was, um, he coached Little League football, uh, Little League baseball. Yes, he did. And he would take what seems like some of the scrubs maybe that's not to cry, unexperienced players. And by the end of the season, he turned that ball club around and that man was one of the finest coaches you'd ever find out there. And he really cared for those kids. He was good. 
and uh, you, you know you have to wonder why he was there with them other than just love of the game and love of the kids because he really he was an awesome coach and he really turned some inexperienced players around and he showed them how to play it and what to do and he was a great great ball player with them kids I think he actually ran for uh, county commissioner once he did not uh, get the seat but he uh, was he a might. candidate I don't recall that time that might have been a little bit before me but well, I'm sure it was. Mm -hmm. But he was always there for me, and, and he was such a great guy to, to visit with at the nighttime. Um, the list still goes on. There's, there's still the Deerings and the, uh, the Tough and the Gladys and Shirley, you know, my, my two co-workers. Uh, we had a blast together up there when it was just, I guess it was them two and uh, Tony Graff, and it was just us four working for the city at the time. Uh, and that's... Uh, Gladys Weiss and Shirley Wurchin, uh, they were just a lot of fun. And back then, they wore so many different hats. You know, I can imagine what it would be like now trying to do some of the duties that they did because they were, they were the municipal court clerk. They were, they typed reports for me. They sent out the water bills. Uh, they collected the water bills. They collected payments on everything. They issued permits. They did it all. And they knew how. I mean, it was a. It was one of. The, it was never one of those things. It's not my job. Mm -hmm. They really did it, and they were always so much fun to be around. Um, it, it was just a wonderful world in those days with these these great people, and all these things combined kind of sold me on Pflugerville. They helped me say I made the right choice of coming out here with these folks because these are really good, down to earth folks, and. Uh, Again, I, I, you know, I, I mentioned so many, or I mentioned some. That's still just a drop in the bucket from the fine people that I met out here. Did you meet uh, JB and Mildred yes. Marshall? Yes, JB and Mildred. I, oh, I enjoyed those. Uh, she ran the tavern, and, and JB was there. Uh, then later on, gee, who had it first, Norman? Uh, or was it the, they had it? I think there was a beer joint on one side and grocery store on the back side. Uh, and I got to know all those people, and the, the marshals were great people. Uh, JB's still a great guy, too. Very good. Well, thank you so much. All right. I appreciate your uh, Okay, um, let's go then to some of the characters in town um, that you might recall, either businessmen or citizens or our regulars that were around. Well, we certainly had our characters, but they were all fun, wonderful characters. Uh, I guess most of my thoughts always go back to the early councils and the people that served on them. Uh, and each year it would seem like they would just develop a bigger and better vision for Pflugerville. Um, and we just had some great folks in town. Mr. Ivy I do remember him. He was, he was not uh, on the council at the time when I took over. Mr. Bowles was the mayor. Uh, and I have to thank these early councils for giving me an opportunity to grow. Uh, a lot of times these little cities, they want to get involved in the police and telling them how to do things. And, I, and they actually gave me an opportunity to, to do it maybe Andy Griffin style and add a little twist to that. And, and yet enforce the law. I mean, that's still important to you uh, to be able to do that. And so the early councils, they were, uh, they gave me the chance and they asked me to explain, you know, which is a lot better than telling me this is the way you got to do it. Because sometimes well-intentioned people do not necessarily know the law and what should be done or how to do it. And they, they gave me the opportunity to grow and explain. And I did grow a lot with them also. Uh, I grew to understand what they are uh, what they wanted. Uh, so do you remember some of the business people? Was Mr. Becker still uh, had his sewing station or the U-Totem was already here? The U-Totem was here uh, when I got here. Uh, U-Totem was, was the big hangout for everyone. There was a big night for Halloween at, at U-Totem store. Everybody, at that time, everybody enjoyed eggs and they would throw those eggs into U-Totem store and for weeks after that, it would smell like rotten eggs. They couldn't get them all out. It was, 
<laughs> it was it was really a big time for all the goblins to come out because the goblins came out in Pflugerville on Halloween night, so and it was a big, pranks. Uh, the excellent pranks. Yes, there Tell there was a lot. Some of those. Uh, well, so that was uh, I guess the funniest ones was the uh, the throwing of the eggs, and, the, and you know I, I could sit there all night and I wasn't going to catch them because they they were really fast on the eggs and they were fast on the water balloons. Uh, they were fast to crawl the water tire and do some painting on it too. And you know, no matter how hard you try, they would they'd still sneak by me. Uh, there was a lot of papering back in those. They loved to paper the high school. Call it paper. Oh, and paper, paper and paper. and they would, you know, as a rule, most of the time they were very good about what they wrote with, so it could actually be cleaned up. Uh, there was there was some vandalism that was a little harder to clean, but most of it was pretty clean fun. Uh, and that was a hard tradition to break. Was the Papering of the high school, they really loved to do that. And uh, uh, one night I, I just missed them, and uh, I went up and cleaned the school. You know, I don't know if anybody in the world knows that, but I picked up all the paper, I cleaned the windows, and they had nothing to enjoy come mor next morning because it was cleaned. And uh, <laughs> I was kind of embarrassed that I, I let it happen, yet. They didn't get to enjoy it after I cleaned it. You know, so I went through hard work to clean that building, for, to clean the high school for them. So that, uh, that even pervades today. Uh, you think about a lot of the criminal acts, uh, even though they're more severe probably than the papering. But sometimes they perform these acts so that they get the attention, whether it's uh, newsworthy and they, they want to see what they've done that everybody sees. Yes. A lot of that, you know, they enjoy seeing the graffiti, and, and I guess you could say this was graffiti, but it said Seniors 1982 on it uh, instead of anything else. They were more proud of that. And, that, and uh, you know, they really took, I think, a lot of care not to destroy property mm -hmm. other than throw a lot of paper out and, and uh, paint on the windows. Um, we're going to go to uh, a more modern time. Uh, uh, you became um, manager of the city, I think, and uh, during uh, the last uh, decade or so, we've uh, had Lake Pflugerville to come uh, open, and there was the construction of that. Uh, do you have any recollections on the plan and um, the building of Lake Pflugerville and to where it is today, where it is a recreation and providing the uh, water? There was a lot of effort put into uh, Lake Pflugerville, and a lot of it was done before I uh, took over that position. Lake Pflugerville and, and many of these other things that were done, uh, they did a great job on it. They did a wonderful study on it before they, they went off in this direction. Uh, that was one of the, if you're going to have good quality growth, and that's always been important for Pflugerville is to have good quality growth. Uh, and you can't control your growth if you can't control water or wastewater. Uh, you've got to control something in there, and you can't go out and annex everything because growth should really pay for itself, and you start annexing, you're really stretching yourself even thinner. And Pflugerville, that's, that's always been a challenge here, is the money uh, because we lack the base, the tax base. Uh, and you really could, it, the taxes would really, really be high if, if they had, wouldn't have had these uh, opportunities of the stores coming in. Um, so there was a grant that was available with the Lake Pflugerville project? No, no it was it not. Was, it was all tax the, the city had to build, uh, had to raise the rates on everybody on water and wastewater, and they did that for a couple of years to get enough money in, the, in there to bond them. Uh, they, it, something to do with bonding, you have to have enough ca uh, capabilities to, to support it. So they raised the rates and uh, and built it, and the lake was a wonderful project. We were able to uh, go out and hide, you know, hide brush piles out there, and we brought round uh, concrete containers out there for the fish to have a habitat. And uh, actually, I have a map on that thing where it shows where all the fish are at, but I won't share it. <laughs> yeah, I had an advantage, but I, I've only fished out there one time with my grandson. Uh, a couple of those people have found those those locations, and, and there's some very good fishing places out there. The trail, we were able to get the trail, and at the time we were hearing, we have such a beautiful lake, why don't we have some more amenities out there? Well, the city was pretty short of money at that time to have any amenities out there. And through a grant uh, through the LCRA, uh, we were able to put the trail around it. 
and, and through the parks and what well, we put, some of it was LCRA money and some of them we got from the, the parks, uh, state parks department to get the trail out there. Uh, and that really worked out well and it was a good beginning. Uh, we got donations to build a lot of those piers that were out there. It was through a lot of, Private. from individual donations to, to build those piers. Uh, otherwise, uh, they wouldn't have been there at that time. So we had a, a great uh, great thing there, but we just didn't have the funds to do anything with it other than uh, a little at a time. Um, they then started the uh, Firecracker July 4th celebration. Yes. Uh, and that was... Uh, Another uh, opportunity for citizens to celebrate, but uh, again, it took some intense planning, particularly on the uh, traffic side. Yes, on the, uh, the first year, it was a uh, it was a pretty tough Fourth of July. There was a lot of folks out there, uh, and no place to park. And we learned just just like always, there was learn we learned things that went wrong on that one, and it made it better and better. Uh, just like Deutschen Fest, everything. Everything has been looked at and reviewed, and Pflugerville has been great about learning from their mistakes and not doing it again. Uh, you were talking about uh, annexing. Part of uh, the growth of Pflugerville has been the um, information of the ETJ and talking to uh, landowners, property owners, to the uh, uh, outside of the city limits to plan for the future. Talk about that process. Well, at the time, we, Pflugerville was, to, you, have to main, you have to be able to control your, control something to make it uh, have good growth. And Pflugerville didn't control the water out there. They didn't control the wastewater. But Pflugerville was really set on the desire to control growth. We're not talking mansions. We're not talking extravagant things. We're talking about making sure there's parkland dedication. We're talking about good quality roads being built out there to Pflugerville standards so we don't have to go out and rebuild them. Because uh, that happened a lot when there's when it didn't have our type of control. And there was a lot of houses that we that were built that we that weren't being inspected, they weren't being built probably to a good code. So it was very important for Pflugerville to go out there and control this area and make sure that it's built quality for everybody. Uh, and it does sometimes cause a hardship on the home on the landowner because he wants to sell his land uh, and we put these stipulations on it but what we do is help maintain the value of that land maintain the value of the, the value of the houses and so the city wanted to move west and we went out and talked to all the people out there about signing up and agreeing to come into city uh, ETJ and uh, this really helped uh, I guess had that happened many years ago Pflugerville's ETJ would have been a little bit different on the east side of town, or excuse me, the west side of town, uh, where we, st at the time when I started here, the Pflugerville Stadium, the football stadium, only a few feet of it was inside the city. The rest of it was in Austin's ETJ. At Gatlinburg, the, the Austin had to release the land that the sewer plant was built on because that's how small we were. Uh, it was just, and, and so it was really critical that Pflugerville find a way to get the right kind of growth out here. Because we saw that uh, good growth affects not just the people in the city, but it affects the schools. And that was always a key part for Pflugerville's thinking, was to help the schools out. And uh, I really do hope we've done that over the years, of helping the school by maintaining a, a great community. I like the phrase that you've used, we've learned from our mistakes and we do better the next time. And that's a perfect example there also on that, uh, the ETJ. Um, SH 130 has been a, an economic engine and a game changer in the Pflugerville arena. So talk about uh, when it was the first concept, when you first heard the concept of SH 130 uh, up until actually driving on it. Oh, gee, the first concept of 130 was probably when I got here. But at the same time, everybody was talking about how Disneyland was coming out, too. I haven't seen them show up either. So a lot of times these things were where they would start talking about it. And it was supposed to go down the old railroad. Uh, that's where 130 was, or that main road was going to be. And it's been moved back and forth. And, and then it finally happened. You know, I, I really don't know how it really happened. And they pulled it off other than the the state pushing for it and they did the toll. I don't know that it would be out there had it not been for a toll road. 
I don't know where they'd have found the money to do those things because it did cost them. And they moved fast. Uh, the TxDOT really built that highway fast. And when you look at it, they built it pretty darn good. They, they really made a good road. Uh, Pflugerville saw right up front that this was going to be the economics for Pflugerville. This was going to be a place where we're going to change that tax rate. Uh, and early plannings, with the, the state was great about giving the, and the owners, of course, wanted the, the entrances and exits uh, in part for their, their giving the land or selling the land uh, so that we were able to have a good frontage road on the side of the side of 130. And a lot of plannings went into it. The city had to tackle water. At the time, it was a, uh, the rural water supply was, uh, it was in their service area, so we had to work to get that over to, our, uh, to the city so that we could provide enough water where you could actually have good water pressure in that area to support business. Uh, the rural water supply, great organization, but they were not in a position to supply uh, major development, especially like this one coming on, or even uh, uh, the existing. Uh, like at Stone Hill. Stone Hill, yes. They couldn't have provided that. So the city worked real hard to obtain that right away, or that the, the certified area from uh, the wa rural water supply, and that helped open it up. And there was a lot of 130 meetings with these other cities talking about what they're doing and how they're planning it. And the city of Pflugerville had already planned and had all this in place while these other cities were talking about how they were going to control it. And Pflugerville did a very good uh, a planning uh, on that road and for what kind of business and, and industry and what was going to be allowed and how that was going to be done way before that road was finished. And they really did a great job on it. The planning, uh, was it the Planning and Zoning Commission, again, that was made up of citizens, or was it and the leaders in the city, and then was PCDC involved? At the time, PCDC was, yes, they were, well, they came involved, but really the whole thing was everybody's goal was to make that good for us, to make it help pay. Uh, I don't think of anybody that wasn't on, on, on the wagon with us trying to make this happen. Uh, and there's nearly, uh, I think, five exits for Pflugerville yes. off of that, which is unusual. Um, yes, it is. Uh, from all the way from Georgetown to Seguin, which is the length of the yes. H-130. And so that was foresight. Yes. And a lot of that had to do with, uh, I think, the, the owners of the land as much as it did anyone else. They worked real hard to, uh, they had a good vision. Uh, they had been in the community for years as well. And, uh, you know, they did a, a great job of, of uh, helping to get those, those uh, frontage roads on there. Um, citizen participation and volunteerism is, is important in a community. And there are numerous commissions within the city that uh, citizens can serve on. Uh, you want to talk about those different commissions or how citizens can really get involved? Uh, they, and they, can, they do make a difference. You know, it's, it's so important that they become a part of the uh, the goings on, and we have the, the library board. We have uh, uh, you could serve with parks. I mean, with the uh, parks department, uh, planning and zoning, the board of adjustments. Uh, you can be a citizens on patrol, and there are just tons of opportunities to get out there and be a part of the uh, the community and do these things. And it's it's such a learning opportunity as well to really understand about the uh, what's going on. And it's not just open for older people. It's a great opportunity for the kids to come get involved in things like Deutsch and Fest and uh, simple things like kid fish out at the, at the lake. Uh, that's one of the events they hold annually. And, you know, if you can ha take a fish off a line and help a kid throw, a, uh, throw his worm out into the water, what a great opportunity uh, to help these children do those things. So there's great opportunities for volunteering. And, uh, you know, t this... United States and Texas, all of this was built on volunteers. And the need of volunteers is still there today. And uh, you have to share your points of view and your ideas with, with the people that are here and, and, and make it a better place. And by volunteering, sometimes they...